Great. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. And um, I hope that this, is, this will be an interesting uh, program for you. I see we already have some questions in the chat box. And um, let's see, searching for Roma tomatoes, Malabar spinach, digging up invasives and other, other tomato related questions. So um, we can come back to those maybe at the end and uh, see if you've gotten the answers that you all needed for those questions. Um, I guess for the, um, my presentation today, I'm talking about vines and ground covers. And um, I went ahead and put this presentation up in um, a, a drive uh, cloud account. So if you want to access it later, you can find it at the URL that you see on the screen there. Um, I'll just write, oops. Uh, it's uh, go.unl.edu slash vines. So if you want to look at it again later, you sure can. Um, so as we go through the presentation today, please just go ahead and type your questions in the chat box and I will try to keep an eye on that and uh, we'll answer your questions as we go along. And then um, if I haven't answered all the questions, especially those related to your vegetable questions, we can come back at the end and we can uh, see if we can come up with some answers for those. All right, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, before we actually jump into talking about the plants, I wanted to give you a couple of resources where you can find great information on plants, not just vines and ground covers, but all different types of plants. So the first website that I have up here is the Missouri Botanical Garden out of St. Louis. And they have a, uh, created a great um, database of plant information that's all available on the web. And as you can see here, um, we've got some information uh, for the variegated kiwi vine. And um, they, they tell you how to pronounce the name and then they'll give you all sorts of information about the, you know, any plant that you're looking for. So when I'm looking for plant information and I want specifically to pull it up from the Missouri Botanical Garden, I'll just put in the plant name and then I will put um, MO for Missouri Botanical Garden uh, as keywords and that pulls it right up for me. So this is a great resource for um, all sorts of plant related information. Another resource that I wanted to make available to you or, or make you aware of is this publication from University of Missouri Extension on ornamental vines. Um, it's quite extensive. They have a lot of different plants that they discuss in this publication. And so it's a really great one specifically for vines. Um, and if you're wanting to find um, extension publications uh, from across the US related to plant information, when I'm searching for those things, I'll put in the plant name and then I'll put university behind it as a keyword. And that pulls up all the great um, uh, university publications. Typically, they're extension publications from those universities related to plant information. And there's lots of good information from Ohio, Purdue, um, Missouri, Illinois. Um, so, and those are those are all climates related to ours. So, the plant information that they provide is pretty accurate. All right. So we're gonna jump right in and talk about the plants uh, themselves. And we're gonna start off talking about vines first, and then we'll talk about ground covers later. All right, so um, as I, uh, let me back up just one slide here. So as I was um, trying to narrow down this presentation and get it to fit within my uh, 45 minute time frame for today, I decided I, I was gonna cut out the annual vines um, just because I didn't have enough time to talk about all of them. But there are some great annual vines too that you can grow from seed every year. Um, the one specifically that comes to mind is uh, purple hyacinthine, which is a great annual vine that has some a really nice ornamental features. So there are some good annual vines, but we're going to focus uh, more of our time today on perennials. Okay, so the first one that I have for you here is the variegated kiwi vine. And um, again, as I was trying to put this presentation together for you, I, I decided I would spend a little more time on maybe some vines that are less familiar to you or that you may not uh, be familiar with, rather than some of the more common things that, that you probably are familiar with. But again, if I don't cover a plant that you have questions on, 
please just go ahead and put your questions in the chat and we can uh, talk about those things too. So hardy kiwi vine, um, this is a, um, again, it's kind of a, a lesser known uh, vine that does well in Nebraska. As you can see, it's hardy to zone four. So uh, all the way through the, the northern edge of Nebraska, this plant would do well. Um, it's, a, it's a fast growing vine and it is deciduous. It's not evergreen, so it doesn't hold its leaves all winter long. But one of the most ornamental features about this plant is the variegation of the foliage. As you can see in the picture, the, the leaves are kind of a medium green, and then they have this whitish tip, which also has some pink to it usually, um, and which, which creates a really nice effect uh, for the plant in a landscape. So interestingly enough, these plants are dioecious, which means they have separate male and female uh, uh, plants. And, um, it is reported that the male plants have better leaf variegation. So um, if you're looking for a plant in a nursery, uh, that's just, honestly, if you go to a nursery and you're looking for hardy kiwi vine, they probably won't tell you if the plants are male or female. Um, but you know, if I were picking one out, I would just try to, sh to pick one that was showing good variegation in the container when I was purchasing it at the nursery, okay? They do have edible fruit that's produced in the fall. And you can see the, the pretty little white flowers down in the, the lower left-hand corner. Um, so growing conditions, what do they like? They need um, good well-drained soil. They like full sun. Um, and you're going to get the best variegation on the foliage if the plants are in full sun. So keep that in mind. They can get quite tall, um, 15 to 20 feet. So um, you can prune them to keep them down within a specific size if you only have if you have a shorter trellis or if you're growing this on a fence and it's it's getting um, out of control you certainly can prune it they, they um, tolerate pruning very well so one of the most common cultivars that we see for hardy kiwi vine in the nursery trade is one called arctic beauty so that would be a good one to look for if you're if you want to try this plant um, in your landscape Okay, so here's another great uh, plant that's not very commonly known, and that is porcelain berry. And you can see here from the picture the fruits that this plant produces, and they're smallish fruits. They're probably about the size of an M&M. Um, I would say regular M&M to peanut M&M. They're going to be somewhere in that size range. And the, the, the really attractive thing about these fruits is that they change color as they age, as a lot of fruits do, a lot of berries. But you can see that the fruits start off green, and then as they're uh, maturing, they turn kind of a pinkish color. And then when they have uh, fully reached maturity, they'll be a pretty kind of a bluish color. Um, and so they're, they're very attractive um, uh, uh, fruits in the landscape. So um, this again is a deciduous woody vine. Uh, so the vines themselves are perennial. The vines will live from year to year. And they have a leaf that reminds me somewhat of a mulberry leaf. But you can see in um, the, the picture there that you have a, a kind of a three-lobed leaf in a darker, med medium to dark green color. So porcelain berry is somewhat like a grapevine in that it has tendrils to help it climb. So if you have a structure, a trellis or, or some other structure, um, you'll need to have something that, that the plant can clasp onto uh, so that those tendrils can clasp it and the vine can climb the way that, that you might want it to. Um, so specific growing requirements for porcelain berry, they also like well-drained soil, um, including sandy and rocky soil. And sometimes it can be difficult to find plants that do well in sandier soils, but this is one that will do well. Um, it grows best in full sun, although partial shade will be okay. But again, you're always going to get the best flowering on your plants in, uh, if they're in higher amounts of sunlight. So keep that in mind. And again, this one can get, get quite tall, so 15 to 20 feet on any, any vine. So that's porcelain berry. Okay. Here's another one, kind of unusual, Dutchman's pipe. And um, this one again is hardy all through all of the zones in Nebraska. It's hardy to zone four. 
Um, as you can see in the, the picture there on the, the lower right, uh, where this plant gets its common name from the flowers. And the flowers are kind of a brownish, tan to brownish color. And their shape, they have a very unusual shape that is reminiscent of the, the old pipes that you would see um, some men using that have kind of that U shape, you know, where they come from the, the mouthpiece down in a U and then back up again. So that's where this plant gets its common name. You can see in the, the larger picture that the leaves are quite large. They have large kind of um, spade shaped leaves. And uh, so it gives an unusual texture in a landscape because the foliage itself is coarse. And um, that contrasts with a lot of the medium to fine textured foliage that we have a lot in a lot of our other ornamentals. So um, those large heart shaped leaves. Um, the flowers, you know, unfortunately, one thing about this plant is that the flowers can sometimes be hidden within the foliage and they can be a little bit hard to see. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. If you had a trellis that this plant could grow up and the flowers might, you know, be hanging down beneath the foliage, that might make it a little easier to see them so that you could enjoy them, okay? So again, um, grows well in average to well-drained soil. Um, it does not particularly like to be um, dry. So I would not consider this to be an extremely drought tolerant plant. So if you wanna to try to grow it, um, just make sure that you're gonna, um, just keep it in mind, I should say, that you're going to need to provide good consistent water to make sure that this plant does well when we are in dry conditions, okay? So some of our vines can be you know, quite aggressive. And so to keep them, uh, within bounds and keep them from becoming uh, overtaking your landscape, you need to do some pretty severe pruning. And this is one. So you would want to cut it back in late winter, cut it down uh, to control the growth, to keep it from getting too overgrown. And in some cases with our vines, they, um, an individual vine will grow for several years, but then it may die back. And so if you're not doing regular pruning, you'll end up having a lot of dead woody stems mixed in with with the living stems and it can get it can look kind of messy uh, so again the pruning can help eliminate that issue let's see so lisa had a question here how deer resistant is dutchman's pipe um good question lisa and honestly i can't say that i know for sure i've never tried uh growing this uh to see if deer would would be a, a big problem for it the thing in my mind though, is that this is such a, a kind of a fast growing vine. Even if you did had some, have some deer uh, chewing on it in the initial years, once the plant was, um, say usually it's like three to four years is when we consider a plant well established and it kind of reaches its maximum growth potential. At that point, even if deer did do some chewing on it, this would probably outgrow any damage the deer would do and then you know you'd still have your vine there. So another question was how far back do you prune it? I would say prune it um, back to about a foot or so uh, from the ground and then you would let it grow back again from the base every year. Okay, thanks for those questions. All right. Okay, so American bittersweet. Um, maybe this plant doesn't fit the definition of un unusual or unfamiliar because you probably are all very familiar with bittersweet. Um, and it's a great plant for uh, the ornamental uh, flowers uh, for fall decorations. You know, we love to use them in fall decorations. American bittersweet, again, is a woody vine, deciduous, so it loses its leaves every year. And again, it has separate male and female plants. So um, one question that sometimes we'll get, people will say is my, my bittersweet never has fruits on it. Well, you probably have a male plant. Um, when you go to the nursery, um, this is one plant where it's a little bit difficult to know if you have a male or a female plant because there aren't a lot of, of named cultivars of bittersweet. Um, so with some plants that have males and females, like holly, we know if we're buying a female plant by the cultivar name, like um, uh, red prince or red princess, um, and then the, the you know 
the male plant will be named prince. And so we know we've got male or female. That's not the case with bittersweet. Um, so you, you probably want to grow two or three plants uh, in a grouping together so that you know that hopefully one of those plants will be female. And then you do need the males. You can't have the fruits. If the flowers don't get pollinated, there won't be fruit set. And then you won't have the, the fruits either. So you do need male and female together. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then if, um, if, you, if you have no fruits um, at all for several years, um, and you do have multiple plants, then um, you'll probably have to do some really close investigation of the flowers uh, in the spring to see if you have male flowers or female flowers. And that's something that's going to be difficult to do. So I would say if you took some really close up pictures of the flowers and sent them to, to me or to one of the other, other horticulturists within Nebraska Extension, we could maybe help you identify if you have male or female plants. So Lisa's asking, can you start this from seed? Absolutely, absolutely you can. Um, and again, you, you'd probably need to um, uh, grow several plants out um, uh, for a few years to see if you, you know, which are male and which are female so that you'd know you have a good mix, okay? Um, so American bittersweet is a native. It's native to um, Central and Eastern uh, North America. Um, we oftentimes, uh, uh, we'll find um, Chinese bittersweet, um, or excuse me, that's not the correct name. I think it's Oriental bittersweet, which is not native in North America and is considered in a lot of states to be um, an escaped ornamental, um, almost to the status of being a noxious weed in some states. Um, so you can grow oriental bittersweet. Uh, it, it's not considered a noxious weed in Nebraska, but just you know, try to realize that um, uh, it might be better if you went with the American native uh, just to preserve the, the, you know, our natural ecosystems and, and not uh, have a, a, a non-native plant be introduced into the area, okay? Bittersweet is actually pretty easy to grow. Again, it doesn't really require any special soil. It grows well in soils that are fairly lean or poor soils. Um, in fact, that can be helpful in, in sort of restraining the growth of this plant because again, this is a, this is a pretty um, aggressive vine and it will grow pretty quickly. Um, uh, so having those um, more lean soils can be ideal. It does its very best growth in full sun and you'll have the best flowering under those conditions too. So. Um, and it's hardy to zone three. So um, it's very, very hardy throughout Nebraska. Okay. Okay, Jacqueline Clematis. So again, here's another one that is probably very, very familiar to, to most of us. And the Jacqueline Clematis um, is, is kind of a group because there are lots of different um, cultivars that would fall under the Clematis Jackmanii um, species name. But the, the Jackman clematis are the ones that have the really large single flowers, as you see in these pictures. We're going to look at a couple of other species of clematis here in just a minute that have smaller, they have a, a lot more flowers, but they're smaller. Um, so that's kind of a distinguishing feature. So um, Jackman clematis or the hybrid clematis can be a little bit more difficult to grow. They like, they do need to have um, more of a well-drained, uh, more soil with good even moisture. Um, they're, they're not plants that are going to be um, real tolerant of a lot of neglect. They're going to need to be um, consistently watered. They're going to need to be fertilized on a regular basis. Um, so just keep that in mind that it's a plant that's going to require a little bit more um, a, a particular attention. So another interesting thing about this plant is that it likes to have cool roots, but the plant top, the foliage, likes to be in full sun. So that can be a little bit of a difficult uh, growing condition to create in the landscape. One way some gardeners will try to provide these growing conditions for clematis is to plant some other plants around the roots so that the roots of the plant are shaded and you're keeping the soil a little bit cooler 
than um, might be uh, common in just a normal air temperature in the middle of a summer day. Um, so shade the roots if possible. Um, if you can't plant any plants around the base of the roots, then definitely mulch. Mulch the soil and the, you know, a, a thicker layer of mulch, two to three inches thick, uh, in as large of an area as you're willing to provide around the base, I would say at a minimum about a foot out from the, from the base of the plant in a, in a circle all the way around. The mulch will help provide some uh, cooling um, uh, temperature moderation to the, the roots of the plant too. But then, um, but then it have the foliage in full to partial sun. I, and again, the more sun you can provide the plant with, the better that it will bloom and flower for you. Um, so how do you prune clematis? Um, it, it depends, clematis can be a little bit tricky on the pruning. It, it depends on each specific cultivar, whether they bloom on new wood or old wood. Um, so that's something that you're gonna have to observe on the plants in the spring. Are the flowers coming from the older woody parts of the stem? Are they coming from the new green stems that have just been just grown um, that year? And then you're going to base your pruning on that. Um, if it's if it's blooming blooming on new wood, then you have more options uh, on pruning because you can prune harder into the old wood, and you'll still get the new growth, and you'll still have the flowering every year. If they're blooming on old wood, you're going to need to um, do your pruning after. The plant has flowered, uh, which will then allow some new growth to regenerate in the later part of the summer, and hopefully um, then that, that new growth will bloom the following year, okay? Um, all right, so um, clematis can also have problems with a disease called clematis yellows, which um, is, um, is a disease that they can get a fusarium, um, uh, a fungal disease that they can get from the soil. And um, what we find is that younger plants are usually more affected by clematis yellows. And once a plant has become well established, you know, usually past that um, three to four year mark, that, that they usually will grow out of clematis yellows and become um, less susceptible to infection by this fusarium. Um, if you do have clematis yellows develop on your plant, you, you typically want to just prune out that vine that is showing the yellowing, and, um, and then hopefully it won't spread onto additional stems. So it can be kind of a problematic uh, disease on this plant. Usually it doesn't kill the entire plant, but it, it, it can kill certain stems. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, English ivy. I won't say a whole lot about English ivy because again, I'm sure that you're probably all very familiar with this one. Um, again, it can be a very aggressive, kind of a, a fast growing vine. Um, and the, the vines themselves can live for a long time, for many, many years. Um, if you're using English ivy as a ground cover uh, or as a vine, um, make sure that you, I would, I would suggest that you not let it climb on your house, especially if you have wood siding because the, the vines can hold moisture against the wood, which can cause you know, wood rot. Um, if you have a brick house, uh, it's, it's not as much of an issue, although over, after many, many years, the, the um, English ivy uh, climbs by holdfasts, which are little, little um, almost like sucker-like um, modified structures that the plant creates that attach the vine to the structure that they're growing on. And, after many, many years, they can affect the mortar um, that, um, between the bricks on a brick house. So um, it's, it's something to just keep in mind that they can be an issue uh, and uh, keep it off of wood or from around windows, with, you know, they have wood casings, okay? But English ivy is, is really very easy to grow. Um, average soil, well-drained soil, partial to full sun. They do produce a little blueberry that birds do love to eat. So keep that in mind because um, the birds will spread the plants throughout your landscape and you could have little English ivies coming up here and there that the birds have planted. And so when, if it ever appears in some place where you don't want it, you're going to want to dig those plants out um, uh, so they don't just, you know, become kind of an aggressive uh, problem that you don't, uh, don't like. 
Okay. So Virginia creeper is very, very similar. And I'll point out to you here. So, oh, excuse me. Um, Virginia creeper and Boston ivy are the two that I wanted to point out because they're both in the same genus, Parthenocissus. So they're very closely related to each other. Virginia creeper is one that people often mistake the foliage for poison ivy because it, Virginia creeper has palmate leaves which have five leaflets, five leaf parts. And if you remember poison ivy is three leaflets together. So, um, but sometimes people will, will mistake this for poison ivy. Um, it's, a, um, it's actually a very pretty, pretty vine, especially in the fall. And you can see in the lower picture there, um, uh, some of the, the fall color that it has. Um, in fact, in, in where I have seen this growing, oftentimes in the fall, the leaves will be more of a darker maroon color intermixed with some of the lighter reds and yellows. So you get kind of a, um, a spectrum of color uh, within the Virginia creeper in the, winter, in the fall. Um, they do have little flowers that are kind of inconspicuous, and then they also have a dark blue berry that birds love to eat. And so um, the birds will again spread this one um, uh, through the fruits or through the seeds. So, you know, if it pops up any place where you don't want it growing, then you'll just have to, to dig those plants out, okay? This one climbs via tendrils, uh, similar to uh, what, uh, again, what you might would find in, in a grapevine, okay? And again, a, a caution against using this on, or letting it grow on houses with wood siding, uh, because uh, it can be difficult to remove and it can cause damage, similar to what you would see with the English ivy. So here's Boston ivy. And oftentimes people will confuse English ivy and Boston ivy. Um, the leaves do look similar. Um, although Boston ivy, the leaves are usually bigger than what you'll see with English ivy. And English ivy leaves are usually five, they're palmate and they have, excuse me, they have five points to the leaf like your hand does. Whereas Boston ivy has three points to the leaf instead of five. Um, uh, Boston ivy is um, evergreen, so, excuse me, now I have to take that back. I'm, uh, English ivy is evergreen. Boston ivy is, is kind of sort of evergreen. Some of the leaves will fall, but then some of them will stay on the plants throughout the winter. So it's, it's kind of a semi-evergreen, as, as you can see here in the, on the slide. Again, like English ivy and Virginia creeper, it has a, a dark blueberry uh, that birds love and, and that they will spread um, throughout your landscape. So uh, keep that in mind. But it, it can be, you know, if you have a structure or you have maybe a wall where you want to cover, um, maybe screen a view or something like that, uh, Boston ivy could be a really nice plant to use to cover that. So American wisteria, and I think this is the last of the vines that I have here for us to take a look at. We oftentimes get a lot of questions about wisteria uh, from gardeners, and um, American wisteria is the native, um, the native plant. No, it's not native in Nebraska. Um, I believe it's more native to the eastern part of the U.S., uh, but um, it is native to North America. Compared to Chinese wisteria, which is not native in North America, that, that obviously comes from Asia. Chinese wisteria um, will, will sometimes bloom earlier than American wisteria, which is one of the things that people like about it because it can be, it can be quite a waiting game um, to, um, to eventually get an American wisteria to bloom. It, it, it takes them a long time to reach maturity before they start to flower. Um, sometimes it can be, you know, 10, 15 years after you've planted the plant before it starts to bloom. And of course, the flowers are usually what people plant it for. Um, there are some techniques that you can use, um, including root pruning, which will help to um, hasten the blooming um, to help plants mature quicker. Um, so there are some things that you can do to help speed up the blooming. Um, but I'll just um, point out that you know, again, just in preserving our natural ecosystems, it would probably be better if you planted American wisteria over um, Chinese wisteria. So I'll just um, uh, bring that up. 
But American wisteria is very hardy throughout Nebraska. It's hardy to zone five. Um, put in the full sun. It really needs to have that good full sun for plants to um, grow well, be vigorous, and help uh, speed up the blooming of the plants. Again, here, this is a plant that needs well-drained soil and it needs good moisture. So it's not a plant that's gonna be especially drought tolerant. So you're gonna to need to, to um, make sure you keep up with the watering if we're in a, a dry period of the summer, okay? It also prefer, prefers slightly acidic soil. And you know, our soils in Nebraska um, usually are in, are usually seven or above. Um, if the land has not been farmed, um, typically it's, it's seven to 7.5, sometimes all the way up to 7.8 in pH. So when we say slightly acidic, we mean pH 6 or below, down to 5.5 um, would be slightly acidic. And so to get that, you know, you could amend the soil with some peat moss or pine needles, or you could add, um, uh, you could add sulfur to the soil to help pull the pH down into that, that um, slightly acidic range. But that, those are the conditions that the wisterias really prefer as compared to our heavy clay soils that we, we have throughout much of eastern Nebraska, okay? So, you know, you can see the beautiful wisteria flowers here and they, they do have um, a nice fragrance to them. Um, so that, of course, is the, the beautiful thing that, that people have in mind when they think about wisteria. All right, so those are the vines that I had to, to uh, talk about today. So if you have any questions about those, please feel free to type uh, those questions in the chat and we can, um, we can answer those. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and we'll start looking at some ground cover plants now and, um, and take a look at some of those. So I tried to put in a, kind of a selection of ground covers, um, some that do well in sun, some that do well in shade, so that we can give you kind of a range depending on what it is you're needing in your landscapes. Um, so we'll start off with, and of course all of the ground covers that we're going to look at today are all perennials again. We don't have any annuals uh, in the list here today. So the first one I wanted to mention to you here is bishop's weed, or sometimes this is called snow on the mountain, um, or gout weed, I've also heard it called. Um, and of course this is grown the, the really nice thing about this plant is that it's a really a pretty tough plant. And so if you have a difficult location, maybe you've got some fairly poor soil, you've got some compacted soil, or you've got a very um, hot, dry location, bishop's weed is a plant that would, would grow well in those places. So um, you can see that the, the preferred growing conditions here are average soil, dry, dry to medium soil, and well-drained. So um, that's what it prefers, but it really will grow well in some pretty difficult conditions. So um, it spreads underground through uh, underground stems or rhizomes, and so it will slowly kind of colonize an area uh, where you plant it. Uh, it does have flowers, but the flowers are not especially showy. If you look very closely in this picture, you can see a few flowers. I'm not sure if you guys can see my pointer, but uh, there is a flower, there are a couple of flowers right here that you can see. Um, if you have an area where you're having trouble with erosion, uh, bishop's weed is a plant that can help hold the soil. Those rhizomes and the, the um, extensive root system that it develops will, can really help with the erosion issues. So on the flip side of this, it, it is a plant that can become aggressive and it can be difficult to get rid of. It's, it's funny that I, I just had a question from a person this week uh, asking how they could get rid of this. They were wondering if someone actually planted this plant on purpose and how could they get rid of it in their landscape? So it was, you know, it, it is, um, it can be a difficult one to get rid of if you ever decide you don't want it because you have to kill all of those rhizomes in the soil before it will stop coming back again. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for a really tough plant that, that will not be killed by a lot of things, Bishop Weed is your boy. But, you know, keep in mind that um, it, it can, it can edge over into the aggressive uh, side of things too, okay? All right, there, and I, 
mentioned down here, um, unvarigated shoots. You know, there sometimes plants will will tend to revert back to their more um, their more natural state, and unvarigated, fully green foliage is always more vigorous than variegated foliage because totally green leaves photosynthesize better than variegated foliage does. So if you if you plant bishop's weed and you have some green uh, shoots that appear, you're going to want to prune those out because they will grow over time and they could eventually overtake the variegated, uh, more attractive foliage and you could, you could lose it, okay? So that's bishop's weed or snow on the mountain. Here's one that is um, much more dainty and not nearly as aggressive as bishop's weed and that is Grecian wind flower. Um, so this is one of our anemones. Uh, that are great landscape plants. And this is one of the spring blooming anemones. Um, and the, as you can see, the plants are pretty petite. So the, the height of this is about six to eight inches. Um, and uh, the flowers stay fairly close to the ground uh, in and amongst the foliage. So, um, but it's a great plant to have in a landscape if you want some really early flowers. And you can see that the color range in the Grecian windflower is blue and white, sometimes pink or a purplish red color also. And um, the foliage is, is almost fern-like. It's, it's, um, it's very finely cut and lobed. It gives a really soft looking texture. Um, the plants really prefer uh, amended soil. So we're looking here for something like um, uh, some peat moss or some compost or some added organic matter um, in the in your soil if you want to get your your wind flowers to do well and then you know put them in dappled shade and I would say for us in Nebraska morning sun would be fine but some afternoon shade would really be ideal these plants um, will not perform especially well if they're in a place where they're gonna get pounded by heavy, intense afternoon sunlight. So give them some afternoon shade, okay? Let's see, Carrie had a comment here. Bishop Sweet does not outcompete creeping bellflower. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I'm wondering if your creeping bellflower, is that one of the campanulas that you have tried? Um, you, might, you might just mention that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so and I should, um, you know, so the first plant we mentioned, bishop's weed, full sun to partial shade, uh, Grecian bellflower. Also, I would say partial shade because we wanted to have that afternoon shade. Now here we're going with an artemisia, and the artemisias are plants for hot sun, uh, full sun, hot locations. Once they're established, they really do well under under very dry conditions. So um, if you have a, a dry location where you need a ground cover, artemisia would be a great one to try. Um, and artemisias are wonderful because they bring this beautiful uh, whitish gray foliage to the landscape. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Dusty Miller. Dusty Mil Miller is an annual species of artemisia. And so here we're looking at a perennial version. Um, and silver brocade is just one of the cultivars of artemisia that are available for landscapes. I chose this one for our talk today because silver brocade is a low growing artemisia. It stays fairly close to the ground. It's not going to be really um, tall and upright, but it, it brings that beautiful soft foliage with the, the kind of rounded lobed leaves to a landscape. Uh, and it's a beautiful, just sort of a, a low creeping ground cover. Um, one thing to keep in mind, it does need well-drained soil. If you have an area uh, like say at the base of a downspout where it stays fairly wet for certain periods of the year, or especially if it's wet in the winter time, that is not a location where artemisia would do well. Um, it needs to have dry roots in the winter and it needs to be well-drained and, and mostly dry in the summer. Um, but again, a, a beautiful plant and it will it will just slowly creep, uh, and, and it's not what I would consider an aggressive plant at all. It'll just slowly creep and get a little bit bigger every year and, uh, and cover an area. And of course, after you've had it in place for a while, you can easily divide it, and you can um, transplant it to other uh, locations in your garden. Okay. 
All right. So basket of gold. Basket of gold is another great ground cover. Um, it's kind of an early summer bloomer and it's covered with all of these beautiful little yellow flowers. It reminds me a little bit of a lissum, which is an annual, only, it, only the flowers are in this case yellow instead of white as we see with most alyssums. Um, and of course alyssum is an annual, whereas basket of gold is perennial. So um, uh, beautiful little clusters of yellow flowers. The foliage itself is kind of a gray green foliage. And um, again, this is a plant that also needs really excellent drainage. In fact, you could all, all, um, almost plant this in a rock garden. If you have an area where you've got sandier soil or even gravelly soil, um, the artemisia that we just looked at and basket of gold would be plant, good plants that you could think about for those areas, okay? It needs full sun. Uh, this plant really is, is not shade tolerant much at all, so plant it in full sun. Okay. All right, snow in summer. Um, so not to confuse uh, uh, cerastium with the bishop's weed or the snow on the mountain we looked at, this is snow in summer. And um, again, cerastium or snow in summer is a pretty tough little plant. And it, it really does need very full sun, again, um, to do its best. It's hard to see the foliage very well in these pictures, but the foliage is, again, kind of a silvery color, grayish foliage. Um, and then you have these beautiful little white flowers. So plants uh, have underground runners or rhizomes and will just gradually spread. The clump will get bigger and bigger as this um, spreads over time. But once it's established, uh, you know, usually after you get past that first establishment year, this plant is very tough and drought tolerant. And so you, you don't need to do a lot of babying um, or special care. This plant will just grow and do very well with little care from you. Okay. Very winter hardy, hardy to zone two. So obviously would do great throughout Nebraska. Okay. Here's one of my favorites. Um, leadwort or, or plumbago um, uh, is a, a great little low growing ground cover. And the foliage, as you can see here in the picture in the summertime, is just a medium kind of a green. Um, when we have uh, cool spring weather, the, the foliage is kind of tinged with maroon around the edges. Uh, and then in the summer, it, it kind of perks up and it's just sort of this nice medium green. The foliage is fairly low growing. It's usually around, in, in my landscape, I would say it's somewhere in six to eight inch height range. Um, then later in the summer when it starts to bloom, it gets a little bit taller. I'd say, you know, in that 10 to eight to 10 inches, possibly up to 12. Um, so it stays fairly close to the ground. And the picture here doesn't really do this plant justice because the, the flowers are blue. They're a true blue. And it can be hard, especially in perennials, to get flowers in your landscape, which are true blue. Uh, but these are, and they're almost an electric blue. It's a really bright colored blue. Um, it really stands out in a landscape. And then when we start to get frost or cold night temperatures in the fall, the foliage will turn this beautiful kind of a maroonish, bronzy, green blend. Uh, it's, it's really, it's a very attractive coloration, which especially sets, uh, sets off these bright blue flowers that are appearing in the late part of the summer. So um, uh, this again is a great ground cover. It spreads slowly throughout an area. Um, what I have found in my landscape is if there are areas where I don't want it to, to, um, to spread, I can just pull, them, pull the plants out relatively easily and I can keep it contained uh, within, the, within the location in my gardens where I want it to be growing. And also I don't find this plant will spread into my lawn. Um, it, it doesn't spread into the areas where I have grass uh, growing. It, it stays within the landscape beds pretty easily. So a, a really beautiful little plant, hardy throughout Nebraska and, um, and very colorful, in, especially from I would say about midsummer when the blooming starts into the fall when the foliage turns that, that beautiful color. Okay. All right, 
So here is um, uh, uh, our perennial geranium. And there are many, many cultivars of perennial geranium to choose from. I've just chosen a couple of for you here. Um, and I didn't, uh, sorry, I didn't put in my, uh, in my notes here which cultivars these are. Um, I believe that this one down here in, in, in the lower um, right hand, or excuse me, the lower left hand picture is the purple pillow. And this more maroonish one, I can't remember the cultivar name of that one right off the top of my head. But again, there are lots to choose from. Um, so the, the perennial geraniums are, again, are slow spreaders. So they just kind of slowly will expand and um, uh, multiply themselves in a garden. Um, they're not plants that I would typically consider to be aggressive or invasive. So you're not gonna have those kinds of issues with the perennial geraniums. They're a little taller than some of the plants we've looked at just most recently. Um, uh, six to eight inch height range. Um, I think that that's a little off. I think they're, they're usually a little taller than that. I would say more 10 to, 10 to 12 inch um, is where they'll be. But once again, there's many cultivars. And so if you're looking for a shorter cultivar of perennial geranium, you would just wanna look for one that is within the height range that, that you're wanting for your landscape, okay? The flowers of the perennial geraniums are typically all, um, the more common ones are gonna be blue, light blue to dark blue to purple or maroon, as you see in these pictures, are, are the most common colors that we see. And again, so Lisa had asked earlier about deer, uh, our, our, um, about the Dutchman's pipe being resistant to deer. The perennial geraniums have hairy leaves. They, they're, they're hard to see and you can't really see them in these pictures, but there are little small hairs on the foliage of, of these plants. And, and that's not a characteristic that deer particularly like. So deer usually don't bother these too much. So if you've got a, um, an acreage or um, a landscape in an area where you have a lot of deer activity, this could be a good plant to, to try in your landscape. Um, again, they do need good soil uh, drainage. They will not do well if they are in areas where the soil is staying wet for long periods of time. That's not something that the perennial geraniums uh, do well under. Okay. Oh, let me go back. Didn't realize these, these were animated. This is a plant, again, that I have in my landscape, and it's a, a little plant that I love. It's blooming right now. Um, one of, the, again, the earlier spring bloomers uh, called prairie smoke. Now, there are a couple of different species of GM that we can grow in our landscapes. So during, this is GM triflorum. And again, this is a, a very short little plant. The foliage which you, you can see it sort of in the background of this picture. It's um, uh, very finely cut, almost ferny looking foliage, but the foliage is very close to the ground. It's about, it's, it's under six inches. I would say in most cases it's under uh, four inches, very close to the ground. And these plants spread very slowly. The clumps would just get slightly bigger and bigger every year. So not invasive, not aggressive, uh, but they will just slowly spread. And right now they are in this stage that you see in the picture with these beautiful little nodding pink buds. And they're kind of a darker pink. Um, and then when they flower and the flowers mature, they will, they will open up to this kind of white feathery uh, flower. And then as the flowers get older, this feathery, um, I think that these would be uh, stamens, these stamens will just become uh, paler in color, they'll, they'll be get, get, become more cream color, and they almost look like smoke, which is, you know, where this plant gets its common name of prairie smoke. Um, but they're, they're beautiful little plants, a really wonderful little low, very low growing ground cover. And I have to say that these plants are tough too. Um, uh, the soil in my garden is um, is very, very heavy, really rather poor soil. And um, in the summertime, the areas where these plants are growing are just blasted. They are in full sun all day long in very hot locations. And these little um, prairie smoke plants just, just grow fine. 
after they've gotten rooted and are well established in an area, they grow just fine without with very little attention from me. So I really love these little plants and they're extremely winter hardy, as you can see, hardy to zone one. So that's very, very winter hardy. Um, but a beautiful little, very low growing ground cover for full sun areas in the landscape. If you don't, if you haven't ever tried prairie smoke, you might want to give it a try sometime. Okay, here's a, here's a better look at what the foliage looks like. And they are evergreen. So the foliage uh, stays green in the winter time. And then again, it will just, um, it'll just continue to grow the next year. Okay. Let's see, um, here, this is, this is, oops, I went back. Here is, we're gonna talk now about Lamium, uh, Lamium maculatum, some of the ground cover uh, Lamiums. And here again, we're going back to shady conditions. So the Lamiums do best in the shade. And they're, although they flower, as you can see in the picture, they're grown primarily for the variegation of the foliage. So beacon silver, as you can see, the, the leaves are primarily a silvery green, and then they have a margin around the leaf, which is a little bit darker green color. So the lamiums will bloom in the early part of the summer, uh, from May to about July, with these um, uh, little clusters of uh, pinkish purple flowers. And... Um, they, they do, as I said, prefer partial to full shade, and they need well-drained soil. Again, not wet, wet shade, but dry shade is where lamiums will do their best. So again, they stay fairly short, usually about four to eight inches is, is um, the height range for these. And then they will just kind of um, slowly spread and cover the area where you have them planted. So if you've got a really uh, shady area underneath a tree, um, a lamium would be a, a great plant to consider for that location. Okay, so now we're jumping back into the sunny parts of the garden with a couple of our um, a primroses. And um, uh, the first one that we're going to look at here is to show the evening primrose. And this happens to be a cultivar called Sissy U Pink. Um, sometimes it's just called Sissy U or sometimes it's called Sissy U Pink. So, and you can see obviously where the, the common name comes from, from these beautiful little pink flowers. And the flowers themselves are, are very delicate looking. They're, they're um, you know, the thin petals, um, just kind of very delicate uh, on a, a little bit of a taller stem that holds them up above the plant foliage. And they'll just kind of move back and forth in the wind. Um, and they're, they're very, very pretty. Um, they do best in full sun, as I mentioned earlier, and they will spread through a, um, a stolen root system or, um, yeah, a stolen root system is a good description. Um, you know, they, they can be um, aggressive, you know, in, in that they can spread to areas where you don't want them. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, I think that Honestly, I haven't ever grown this particular cultivar in my landscape, so I haven't ever tried to get rid of them when I didn't want them. Um, but I think that they could be fairly easily dug out of an area where you don't want them to grow. Um, or you can certainly contain them within a, uh, a section of a landscape. Um, oftentimes I've seen them grown in areas where the, the whole garden is bordered on all sides by like some kind of a sidewalk or a curb cut or something like that. And then, and then they're just allowed to grow and fill in that whole area. Um, so, um, and again, if they do bloom, and then when most of the blooms are, are done, if you cut them back, cut the stems back to, you know, about half their height below the old, below where the old flowers occurred, then they will grow back up and they'll bloom again. Um, and so they can have some uh, pretty color for you in the landscape during the summertime. Okay. Um, let's see. Here is the other primrose that I wanted to mention. Um, this is Missouri primrose. And uh, it's interesting because these two primroses, I think if you see them in a landscape, you wouldn't necessarily realize that they're in the same genus um, because they're, they look so different. 
the Missouri primrose is much grows much closer to the ground than um, the showy evening primrose does, and um, it has much narrower foliage. So as you can see in the picture, these the leaves are this kind of elongated, spear-shaped, uh, um, uh, simple leaf. And then the flowers are these beautiful, bright yellow flowers. Um, and the stems are, are kind of reddish. So again, these plants are very drought tolerant once they are established. And again, they prefer full sun, um, as we mentioned earlier. But they're, they're very hardy, very tough, uh, very drought tolerant once they're established. I'm kind of coming down to the end of my time, and uh, I sorry again. My apologies that I was late getting onto the call. I have um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I've got about five more plants to cover. Ooh, no, I have more than that. Um, I guess I think what I will try to do is just maybe go through the last grouping here a little more quickly, and then if you have um, more questions about that, that then we can. Um, we can do that because I definitely want to get to your questions before we wrap things up here. Let's see, and I'm looking at your questions right now. Um, and I'm sorry, I lost track of time a little bit, but LEH had made a comment about rabbits like mine. Put one under a plastic crate and let the rabbits nibble on another one. I'm not sure which plant that comment was, was referring to, so um, uh, if you want to just let us know. That would be great. Carrie had asked, is prairie smoke foliage ephemeral or will it persist? Yes, it is. It will persist. It is evergreen. So it'll stay on your plants all year long. Um, okay. And some of the other folks are saying that they will stay. So that's great. So we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll go through the rest of the plants too. Um, and LEH said, oh, so the geraniums, the, gera the rabbits were liking your geraniums, um, your perennial geraniums. That's interesting. Um, um, so I was talking about deer, and here you're saying the rabbits are going after yours, and so that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Here is the next one, Pachysandra. And a lot of you are probably very familiar with Pachysandra as a ground cover because it is a very, very common ground cover um, that we see in landscapes. Um, it, it has, uh, again, this is another one that's evergreen. So Pachysandra will hold its foliage, hold its leaves into the winter. Um, so you won't have just bare stems uh, standing there in the winter time. Um, and then in the summer, they do have these uh, uh, pretty little um, uh, short spikes of white flowers. So that does have a nice contrast against the dark green of the foliage, of the pachysandra foliage. Um, pachysandra spreads, spreads by rhizomes, so it will just kind of slowly spread to fill an area. And this is another plant for shade, so partial to full shade is really where you want to grow this plant. And here again, Pachysandra struggles a little bit in some of our, our heavy, really heavy Nebraska soils. So if you're wanting to get this one off to a good start, I would, I would um, certainly suggest that you do some soil amendment before you plant it. Add some additional organic matter, some peat moss, some compost, something along that line to help provide that organic matter that Pachysandra really prefers. Okay. Okay, let's see. Here's phlox, the moss phlox. And again, a very common one. You're probably all familiar with moss phlox. Um, blooming right now in our landscape. So again, another early spring bloomer, which is one of the things that I really like about it is those early flowers. And the, the moss phlox come in a range of colors from white to light pink to dark pink to purple or a light lavender color. So we have a lot of different um, colorations to choose from in the moss flock. And I've listed a few cultivars for you here, just again to show the, the wide color range that we have to choose from in the moss flocks. Uh, very short, you know, six to nine inches, uh, easy to grow. You know, they're not very picky about soil type or soil, um, soil organic matter. They can grow in some fairly uh, poor soil. The only thing you do need to make sure is that you give them well-drained soil and that they really do need uh, that to do well. And if you haven't noticed, these are also evergreen. They will hold on to their foliage in the winter um, and, and, and stay green. Okay. 
So here's another one of my favorites, and this is back to the shade garden now. Solomon Seal prefers uh, partial to full shade. So it's a woodland native. Um, it likes to be in the shade of other, other trees or shrubs. Um, so uh, this is the variegated Solomon Seal, as you see in this picture, is the more preferred. It, it's more, a little more ornamental than the typical um, species of Solomon Seal, which just has straight green foliage. Mm -hmm. What I like about these plants is they have these beautiful little nodding stems. So the stems come up and then they just kind of nod over and you've got these, these um, we call it two ranked. So you've got leaves that come out from two sides of the stems that create this almost horizontal layer of foliage on the plant. And then on the underside, there are these little long, elongated bell-shaped white flowers. And the plants that I have in my landscapes are blooming right now. Um, uh, so they, and they just, they have a rhizomatous root system. They will slowly spread, um, easily pulled up or kept within an area. You know, they're, they're not uh, aggressive in, in a way that you won't be able to get rid of them if you don't want them. But they, um, the, the leaves uh, stand about in the 18 to 24 inch uh, height range is, is, is very true. Um, and they just create a beautiful, I almost think of it as an architectural structure to the, the look of the plant um, that can add a lot of uh, um, attractive character to a shady area in the garden. So um, if you've got shade to deal with, I would really suggest a very good Solomon seal as a plant to try out. Here's a look at what those flowers look like when they're blooming. And once the flowers fade, there's a berry that comes on. Um, each flower will turn into one berry and they will be black when they're mature. And I usually don't see berries on my plants because they wildlife eat them off. I, it's, I'm not sure if it's rabbits or birds or uh, exactly what type of wildlife loves these seeds, but they will be gone and I'll never see them. Okay, so I have a couple of um, sedums. Uh, I, I couldn't really talk about ground cover plants without including some form of sedum. And um, so again, the sedums are plants that um, will be back to the, the sunny part of the garden. In fact, even um, like a sandy soil or gravelly soil, or if you have a rock garden, a sedum would be a great plant to have in those locations. Um, and the sedums are all going to have that thick succulent foliage that is typical with this particular uh, genus. And these, the two that I'm featuring here are the lower growing types. So there's other taller sedums that we can plant in our landscape, um, which, which don't spread really, but these low growing sedums do, and they will be a nice ground cover for you. So um, this is dragon's blood, and it gets that name from these red flowers. When it's blooming, um, the flowers are a beautiful, attractive red color, which can really add a nice, um, color accent in your landscape. And all of the sedums, the foliage is evergreen. So they will stay, the foliage will stay on the plants even into the winter. And oftentimes the leaves will turn kind of a burgundy green color in the winter when we're getting cold nights. Uh, but they will still have foliage. So put them in an area where the soil is very well drained. Um, uh, that's what the sedums prefer as a succulent plant. And again, full sun is their ideal location. And these plants, the, the dragon's blood, will be about you know four to six inches tall, or approaching the six inches when it's blooming. Uh, when it's just the foliage, it'll probably be more in the four inch height range. Okay. So here is another species of sedum, a little bit taller. Um, and uh, the flowers in this case are an orangey yellow. It's interesting because the buds themselves are pink, but then when the flowers open, the petals are yellow and the centers of the flowers are more orangish. So you almost get a kind of a color spectrum from pink to orange uh, when these plants are in bloom. And then as you can see the foliage on, on the uh, Kamchatka, it's, it's variegated. You have a white edge, white margin to the leaves, um, which is also another attractive feature of this plant. So um, a, a very interesting sedum uh, to try in the garden. Okay, so sticking with our sunny areas of the landscape, here is lamb's ears. 
Um, and again, this is a more common ground cover, which you're probably more familiar with. It has very soft uh, leaves that are covered with these fine hairs and um, a very velvety soft texture to the plants. Oftentimes lamb's ears are included in sensory gardens because of this, this really soft feature that we have on the foliage. They do bloom, but the flowers are not really particularly showy. In fact, a lot of people don't really like the flowers on lamb's ears and they'll remove them um, and just enjoy the foliage itself. So again, put this in an area where you have well-drained soil uh, and it's gonna get full sun and um, lamb's ear will be completely happy. Um, try not to over hit irrigate. In fact, really, you don't even need to irrigate these at all. So if you have irrigation in your lawn, just try to make sure that it's not hitting the lamb's ear uh, because the lamb's ear um, won't really appreciate that. Okay. Okay. And I think this is the last plant that I have of Vinca minor. And again, Vinca is a very common landscape ground cover that is used in a, in a lot of landscapes. Many of the vincas that are used as ground covers are just a straight green or a green with a white variegation on the leaf. But vinca uh, illumination is a much showier, bright colored leaf with this beautiful yellow green variegation and then um, striking blue flowers when it's blooming. So the vincas have long, um, long stems that will root down. In fact, the stems are almost along the, the um, form of a vine. And wherever the vine touches the ground, it will root down and then you'll have a new plant generated from that location. So sometimes the vincas can get a little messy looking because you've got all of these vines going everywhere uh, and they, they tend to catch leaves and trash and they can, they can get to looking a little messy. Um, if you keep the vines trimmed uh, so it has a little bit more of a manicured appearance to it, uh, it, it can, uh, they'll just look a little bit nicer. But you've certainly got a very striking color combination here with the leaves and the flowers together. Uh, the vincas are not hard to grow. Um, full to partial shade, um, an area with good well-drained soil, and they usually are completely happy. So uh, usually pretty easy to grow. Okay. So that was the last of the plants that I had. And um, I want to go back here to look at some of the questions that you had here. And let's see, we had a question about where would you expect a grapevine that was pruned last winter to be at this time? So I'm assuming that you're asking about what, what sort of a growth stage would the grapevine be in right now? Um, I would be expecting you to see the buds opening, the flower buds opening, and just seeing the very first beginnings of the leaf initials. Um, not much leaf expansion yet, just very small leaves. Um, in fact, it's been cool enough this spring that a lot of trees have almost, uh, they, they budded out and we're seeing the beginnings of leaves, but the leaf development has, has stopped. And I would expect that the grapevine would be in the same sort of situation in that the buds would have opened, you'd see the very beginnings of little leaves, but the leaves would not have fully expanded yet and you wouldn't be seeing any long vining of the growth yet at this point. So that's where I would expect them to be. Um, let's see, let me scroll back here a little bit. And um, we asked about, uh, let's go back to some of your soil questions that you had, or your, excuse me, your vegetable questions that you had. Um, one of the first ones was searching for Roman tomatoes and can't find any. Um, uh, you know, honestly, I haven't really looked at the vegetable transplants in the garden centers uh, very much lately to see what was available. Um, if you're not finding anything locally, then what I would suggest is maybe that you, you purchase plants through a mail order catalog. So um, Burpee or Park, even though those are traditionally seed companies, uh, many of them are branching out and they're also selling plants now, transplants. So if you can't find them locally, then I would probably go to a mail order source to see if you can find them there, okay? Um, Kathy had asked about, someone gave me Malabar spinach seeds, not a true spinach. Um, yes, that's right. Malabar spinach is not a true spinach. It, it, I'm not sure where that common name came from, if it's just because that the, the leaves are used as a green in the way that we might use spinach. Um, 
it's, it's, it's pretty easy to grow. I, don't, I think you'll have pretty good luck at getting the plants to grow from the seeds that you were given. Um, you can almost think about using Malabar spinach, you can chop it up fresh and use it in salads, or you can cook it like you would cook um, um, spinach, uh, where you would kind of uh, wilt it down um, and, and use it that way, okay? Um, Carrie had asked a question about just digging out invasives and adding more natives. That's a good strategy. Um, um, so um, um, maybe you got some ideas for some new plants that you could try. Um, you know, again, one of my favorite natives is that prairie smoke, the, the GM tri triflorum. I just love that plant. Um, it's a great plant to have in a sunny garden. Um, and some of the primroses would also be good uh, natives that you could try for your landscape. Okay. Denise had asked about, I'm trying two new, two new tomatoes, Cheyenne Purple and Mr. Stripey. Cheyenne Purple is just a very popular one. So many people love the flavor on that. And Mr. Stripey, I have heard great things about, although I have not tried it in my landscape, but it's a beautiful um, uh, uh, green tomato with yellow stripes. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, all right, let's see if there's any new questions that came in. Um, which ground covers might be good combinations to replace uh, grass lawn altogether? Well, um, that's a difficult question, you know, and we oftentimes get questions from gardeners about, you know, they, they don't want to grow grass and they want to have some other kind of ground cover. I would say, first of all, we need to know what sort of sun exposure do you have? Is this full sun or is it shade? That's going to make a big difference. Um, one of the alternative ground covers that, that I have seen people use most often is clover. Um, uh, clover can be mowed, so you can keep it, you know, shorter than maybe it would grow naturally unmowed. Um, however, clover does bloom, and you will be attracting bees to those flowers. So that's something to keep in mind, you know, especially um, if you're going to be out there walking, you don't want to step on a bee, you know, or have an allergic reaction or something uh, along that line. Um, there. I guess the bottom line for me is that we, we don't have a lot of alternatives to grass that really make excellent ground covers. Um, and usually when people ask that question, it's because they don't want to manage their lawn at a real high rate. They don't want to have to water it all the time. They don't want to be putting, putting fertilizer down all the time. And I would say you don't have to do that. Um, if you are, um, if you have a, let's say you have a Kentucky bluegrass lawn, and we get into a very dry period in the summer, um, you only need to water it maybe once every couple of weeks to keep the grass from dying, even though it's in a dormant state. But Kentucky bluegrass, in most of the periods of our growing season, fall, winter, spring, early summer, it'll grow fine with no additional water, just using natural precipitation. And then I would pair that with less fertilization. So if you fertilize maybe just once a year, or if you're mowing and returning your grass clippings on a regular basis, that applies one pound of nitrogen uh, to your grass throughout the growing season. So you can really manage turf at a very low maintenance level and still have something holding the soil, preventing you from having mud, you know, or bare dirt, um, but not have to use the very high maintenance uh, practices that are sometimes recommended for lawns. Um, you certainly don't have to do that. And yeah, Carol, thank you for mentioning. John is going to be talking about lawns this afternoon. So hopefully he'll give you a lot of great information about lawn care. Okay. Um, let me see if there's other qu any questions that I missed here. Um, uh, oh, Lisa was asking, any ideas where to find prairie smoke? Um, I have seen it at Earl May um, in Lincoln or Campbell's, or if you're in the Omaha area, um, oh, excuse me, you guys are all up in the Northeast corner of the state. Um, uh, so, you know, I would say the best source would be Bluebird Nursery, but I understand now that Bluebird is not, they don't, their garden land, uh, retail garden center is not open anymore. So you're not going to be able to order it or to just get it from garden land. Um, but you could potentially order from Bluebird um, and get a tray of small seedlings from them. 
but they would be an excellent source because they have such a wide selection of perennials. I know you could find it there. Um, otherwise, if your local garden centers are not, uh, are not carrying the prairie smoke, again, you might have to resort to a mail order catalog to be able to find it. But my first, my first um, source would be Bluebird. I would, I would go there. Okay. Let's see, Beth was asking, I like the tiny white clover. What about Lily of the Valley as another perennial ground cover? Interesting question, Beth. I had Lily of the Valley in this presentation um, and I took it out and I took it out for a couple of reasons. Most of the time, no, I shouldn't say that. Lily of the Valley can be a very aggressive ground cover. And I have had a lot of gardeners contact me and say they're having trouble getting rid of Lily of the Valley. They, did, they decided they didn't want it anymore and they're having an extremely hard time killing it. That's the reason that I didn't include it in this presentation. But again, you certainly, Lily of the Valley is a great ground cover. And as, you know, because it's so difficult to, to kill, you can infer it's, it's a very tough little plant. I, if I were gonna plant Lily of the Valley, I might plant it in a container, almost similar to the way that we would handle mint, because the mints can be very aggressive perennial plants and they can be hard to get rid of once they're established. I would treat Lily of the Valley the same way. Put it in a container and let it grow so you can enjoy it and you can have those beautiful flowers and this, the fragrance, but it won't become uh, a, a thug in the garden that you can't get rid of, okay? And there's beautiful Lily of the Valley that have variegated foliage. There's pink flowers in Lily of the Valley. There's cultivars with pink flowers. So there are some great cultivars to choose from, but that's why I didn't include it today. Okay, let's see, any other questions? Um, it looks like that's it. So thank you so much, all of you for attending. And again, my apologies for being a little late in joining. Um, you had some great questions and I really appreciate that. And I hope that this presentation has been helpful to you. You've, you've gotten maybe a couple of new plants, ideas that you wanna try in your landscapes. And remember, I'm gonna go back to my first slide. If you want to take a look at this presentation online, you can go to and find it online at go.unl.edu slash vines, and you can look at it again, all right? So thank you all very much for, for participating today.